as you're uh, sitting down, turn to Mark chapter 10, <coughs> verse 13. I'm going to do my best this morning, but I'm going to be really honest with you. Uh, I don't know that I could do, <coughs> excuse me, any better than Darian did. Um, that was awesome. Yeah? In fact, if she comes back in here, when she comes back in here, maybe she could just take my place. Joe, do you want to just tell her that she's up? I think she, she already looked at my notes. I'm uh, pretty sure you'll see what I'm talking about here. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here we go. Uh, you read in your copy of God's word as I read it out loud. This is what it says. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. You know, we open God's word to a passage like this this morning, and <clears throat> excuse me, this has been planned for, I mean, this is not, an, you know, it's not like we changed the passage for this morning. And one of the things that we're going to recognize is that life is precious, right? All of life. And... Um, you, you watch the news, you have your social media feeds just like I do, and over the past couple of weeks, um, the truth that life is precious has been clarified for us. We watched uh, about a week ago a gunman open fire and kill 10 black people in a grocery store in Buffalo, and then on the same day, a different gunman uh, opened fire on a church in Southern California, and it was full of uh, people from Southeast Asia. And, and I don't know how you react to that, but for me, it's, it's sort of one of those things that you stop and you ponder and you, you, you grieve a little bit, even though you don't know those people, you grieve with them from a distance. And we could ask, why do those things happen? And, and often that's a question that comes up. And in those cases, we might even have an answer a little bit. It's because, that, it's because racism still exists. Thank you, dude. Appreciate it. Uh, and, and that's, we can't deny that, that racism exists in our country. And then on Tuesday, in Texas, we hear this news, and I don't know about you, but it was one of those things where I turned on the TV, and I had been studying the passage, and I'd been studying on Tuesday, and we read about the little children, and, um, and then you, you see the news where this person goes into a classroom, right? And takes the lives excuse me, of 19 children, and really there's no answer to that. There, there's no way to understand what is happening there. And, and so we, we contemplate that, and we think to ourselves, children have done nothing to deserve what happened to them on Tuesday. That there's this evil that comes and cannot be explained. And, and, and of course, neither did the people in Buffalo or Southern California deserve that kind of evil right? But, but, but children? Come on. And so we come to this passage this morning, and Darian mentioned it in her testimony, and, and it's just sort of <laughs> providential that God would have us be in this passage of Scripture this morning, because we imagine these children whose lives are innocent, whose lives are um, unstained, and we, we sort of pause and we go, okay, we've got to mourn with those who mourn because these children were made in the image of God. Uh, they were precious human beings with value and with dignity. 
And yet I, I imagine that here we are on Sunday morning and even, uh, even after a short period of time, we've sort of already moved on because that's what we do in this country. But um, I, I want us to take a moment and even though we've prayed and we've, we've had uh, worship and we've done all these things, can we just take a moment again and mark that by prayer and join with those who are still mourning that event? Can we do that this morning? Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you and we ask, um, uh, we know that you are a God who comforts. We know you are a God who has all things in his control. We know you are a God who challenges and encourages his people to mourn with those who mourn. Pastor Dale mentioned that this morning. Father, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those that mourn. But then we turn on the news and we have a real life situation before us and we, we, our, our instinct is to say, why, God? Why did this happen to those people who did nothing to bring that on themselves? And so, God, this morning we want to extend our prayers of comfort and compassion to the families who have lost loved ones over the past couple of weeks. We think of these families who are this morning without their precious children. Father, we, 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 we think of the fact that um, this world is broken because of sin. This perfect world that you created is broken because of sin. And Father, we, we, we ask you <laughs> to show yourself powerful in redemption of this world God, knowing that one day in your perfect plan you will, and we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We ask that as we contemplate um, <laughs> children and the preciousness that they have in God's sight this morning, that, God, you would remind us of our status as your children. And, Father, there are those that are here this morning, certainly, who do not have status as your children. Perhaps like Darian, they, they have worked hard to be in your family, but God, they have not by grace through faith accepted the free gift of eternal life. And so, Father, I pray that you would this morning do a miracle in them and welcome them as your children. Father, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Uh, the passage kind of speaks for itself, but we hear these words of Jesus and they do bring us comfort and hope. Uh, Jesus, though, I don't think was necessarily pointing to the innocence of children, although that's certainly an application of this passage. It wasn't like he was drawing some arbitrary line in the sand and saying, at some point, people are innocent before a certain age. And then after they reach uh, an older uh, uh, time frame, an older age, they, they bear the responsibility for their actions. I don't think that's what Jesus was saying. So what is it when um, Jesus, uh, what is Jesus doing when he gathers these children to himself? Um, what, what exactly is he doing? Let's, let's look at this passage together. The first thing I want us to see in this passage is that Jesus' followers care for the weak. Jesus cares for the weak, and so Jesus' followers must care for the weak. So if you look in the text there in Matthew chapter 10, you're going to find these people bringing children to Jesus so that he might touch them. And it seems, if we look at it and we study the passage, that these children are, are probably rather young children. In fact, Mark uses a word that indicates that they may be even as young as infants or toddlers. And in verse 16, we see Jesus take these children into his arms. And again, we get that picture of the tender and loving Savior. When I was young, and maybe this is true of some of you as well, I had a Bible uh, my parents gave it to me, and it had a picture. Uh, it was a cartoon picture of Jesus on the front with, with children and, and a lamp. Maybe you gave that to your children. Maybe you had that Bible as a child. It sits in my office this morning. But I, I remember thinking that that picture made me feel like I had a part in God's family, like Jesus was interested in me. And in this story, Jesus demonstrates exactly that. But, but let's look at the response of the disciples here. It's curious. In verse 13, it says, the disciples rebuked them. Now, it's not exactly clear who they rebuked. They might have been rebuking the children. Scram, you know? Or, or maybe the parents who brought their children to Jesus. 
But, but these men didn't think it was appropriate for, for Jesus, this great teacher, to waste his important time, his important attention on these insignificant young children. Uh, the disciples' response doesn't match our modern sensibilities. Uh, we're used to that idea of a politician who, when he's on the campaign trail, will, take, uh, will shake hands and will kiss babies as a sign to show his trustworthiness. But you rem- may remember that as we've been through the book of Mark a couple of weeks ago, we were in Mark chapter 9, verses 36 and verse 37. And in that passage, the disciples are arguing who's the greatest. Remember that? And Jesus puts before them the way of service, but he also brings and sets before them a child. And as we talked about in that, ch- that passage, that children in ancient times uh, represented the fringes of society. In the disciples' mind, Jesus in this moment had more important things to do. But Jesus right here again, because the disciples still haven't grasped it, is reminding them of his words and of his values. He's reminding the disciples of their mission to serve disenfranchised people, underrepresented people. Because really, this is the pattern of Jesus' ministry. He's made a habit of reaching out and caring for women and outcasts and Gentiles and lepers, people who find themselves on the fringes of society, people who no one thought deserved the attention of this great teacher, of this rabbi like Jesus. The disciples, by contrast, as we've talked about, still have it in their mind that there's a trajectory whereby Jesus gains power and he puts them, his followers, in positions of prestige. The disciples still haven't learned their lesson. They're going to continue struggling this with this for a little bit as we continue studying the book of Mark. This isn't the first time, by the way, that they've rebuked and tried to redirect Jesus. Um, when people come to ask Jesus for his help, they just kind of continually prove that they don't understand Jesus' ministry, Jesus' mission in the world. You, you may remember taking you back in the book of Mark as we've studied it over the last couple of months. Chapter 6, the disciples... Uh, uh, the, the hour is late and the disciples try and send people away uh, because it's dinner time and where, where are all these people going to get food? And Jesus, it says, had compassion on them. This is chapter 6, verse 34, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he supplements, as he teaches them, he supplements his teaching by feeding over 5,000 people. In chapter 8, Verses 31 through 33, Peter, in that great high point of the gospel, at least from a human perspective, declares that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the Holy One of God. But when Jesus turns around and tries to explain to him exactly what the, God's plan is for the Messiah, Peter then rebukes Jesus. Same word as Mark uses here, as the disciples rebuke uh, the children or the parents. Jesus, Peter rebukes Jesus, and he tries to stop him from talking about uh, his death and his resurrection. A couple of pages later in chapter 9, John speaks up for the group of disciples. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. And, and there's this man who's casting out demons in Jesus' name, but he's not part of their group. And John wants to know, Jesus, what are you going to do about this? Um. The disciples are acting kind of more like gatekeepers to Jesus, more like Jesus' bodyguards. He's their, he's their meal ticket because as he ascends to these heights of power and authority, he's going to take them with him. So in order to help him focus and eliminate all the distractions, they're going to run interference with the crowd. Jesus can't wait, and this is their thinking, Jesus can't waste time with these segments of society that are not going to help him achieve what they think is his ultimate goal. Now I want you to look at verse 14. Look at it, your copy of God's word. What's Jesus' reaction? Read it with me. I'll read it out loud. You read it quietly. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. I don't know what your copy says. Mine says indignant. That's a good word. That word, that word means this. 
indignant, to vent oneself in expressed displeasure. This is the only time in the Gospels that this particular word is used of Jesus. In this instance, other people become indignant, but Jesus never does except for here. And his indignance, his displeasure, his vented frustration is directed at the disciples. I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would want to be on the other end of that. (laughs) I don't think it would be scary as much as maybe it would be like really deflating, like when your parents catch you doing something red-handed and you're expecting, you know, sort of the wrath to come down and they just look at you and say, I'm really disappointed in you. The disciples think that they get Jesus, but they're once again struggling to really understand him. Now, in contrast to the disciples, Jesus, verse 16, takes these children in his arms. He blesses them. He lays hands on them. Far from insignificant to Jesus, they garner his time and his attention. Jesus values them. I think it stands to reason for us that if Jesus gives attention to those on the fringes of society represented by these children, so should we who claim to follow him. In this passage, Jesus values children, and so should we. Now, every once in a while, um, we uh, have a a family service. Today's a family service. We welcome the kids, and we have more limited um, uh, um, children's ministries available, and sometimes it's uh, on a Sunday like this where we can all worship together corporately. We get to experience communion or a baptism together, and we're excited to have them. Look around. There's, there's some kids here and there, and they may make some noise here and there, and that's okay. We're glad to have them with us. And, and I would just challenge you Our goal is not to separate out the children so they don't distract us, to to put them over on that wing over there so that we can focus on what we're meant to do and we can avoid that distraction. Our goal is that we would integrate them into our family, as Dale was talking about, that we would see them in the coming years worshiping with us as teenagers and then as adults. We want to encourage and challenge young uh, parents to be discipling and training their kids and raising them in the knowledge of Jesus. Maybe if you're here this morning, just take note of the children around you. And and you you say, well, I don't have any responsibility for young children. Well, then look around, find a young child near you, find those parents and commit. I'm going to, I'm going to pray for that family. I'm going to focus on that child. I'm going to learn their name. I'm going to meet their parents. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to commit myself to being extended family to them. If you're a parent, you, you need to know, and I hope you know this, that we don't just provide children's ministries for a bit of respite so you can come in here and have like an hour to yourself uninterrupted. We want to partner with you we want, to, we want to see you bring your children up in an understanding of God through his word, that they would uh, understand their place, they would understand the gospel and their need of Jesus' salvation. That, that's why we have a children's ministry, is in order to prepare these children in the knowledge of God, in partnership with their parents. We've got a vacation Bible school that's happening in a couple of weeks. We've got Awana clubs during the school year. We've got weekend ministries every week. We believe in these ministries because children are at the ages where they are most receptive to God's word. And you know what? Can I just, can I just say this? This is, the passage focuses on children this is not a commercial message. <laughs> We're in need right now. Over the last couple of years, COVID has, um, has kind of uh, made us so that our workforce for children's ministries has been depleted. And we're trying to rebuild that ministry because 
uh, we want to have those opportunities. And you're going to hear about them in the coming weeks. You're going to hear there are opportunities to join in to minister to children. So I want you to be praying about how you can partner and care for the children of this church. Because they're not just entrusted to the care of their parents, they're entrusted to our care as a church. And, And I think it's true that we could say this, that how our church treats kids says a lot about to our community about who Jesus is and what his values are and what his priorities are. See, the disciples thought that there were more important things than children. And I wonder if you're guilty of thinking the same thing. And it's not just children, by the way. We could extend this out that Jesus' followers are called to embrace all all manner of people on the fringes of society. So when that person who is, does not fit into the mainstream walks into our church, how do you relate to them? Are you welcoming and gracious or you just kind of ignore them because that person makes you uncomfortable? I think too often we retreat into our little comfortable circles of communication, our little social circles in, in the church. And we we talk and we're friendly with those people, but we're friendly without actually ever reaching out. And we pat ourselves on the back and we say, oh, we're so, I talked to a lot of people this morning. I heard one pastor say it this way, and I want to encourage us to, to start thinking this way. He said this, at church, a person alone is a person in trouble. Okay? And so for us, we should have that mindset when we come to church, we're not just friendly with the people we're friends with, but a person alone is a person in trouble. And I'm going to reach out to that person, even if maybe they make me a little bit uncomfortable. But Jesus cared for the poor and the marginalized, represented by the children here. And I think that his example gives us an important lesson in this passage, but we can't just stop there, right? Right? We can't make that the totality of the gospel. Um, The the gospel exists not just in following Jesus' example, but in understanding and in believing his teaching and internalizing that. So let's take a look at Jesus' words as well as his example. And uh, so we're going to look at verse 14, and we're going to see this, that Jesus' followers not only care for the weak, but they embrace their own weakness. This is what it says in verse 14, that Jesus begins to teach his disciples this better way. He says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now Jesus, in his indignance, uh, says a couple of things, and Mark records them for us in a way that helps us understand his mood. It's sort of terse, it's sort of direct. Come, Come on, guys. Let the children come to me. Don't hinder them. Jesus wants the disciples to understand this lesson. It's not just a mercy ministry. It's something more than that. Maybe you, along the way in your life, in your Christian life, have done work with people who are less fortunate with you. Maybe you've gone to a soup kitchen or you've worked with people that are disabled or something of that nature. I remember I was young, and, and we would do that on occasion. We would go to the, you know, the other side of town, and there was a church that fed homeless people, and we would join with them to do that. And that was an interesting thing. As, a, as an elementary school student, as a teenager, it was sort of a complex thing for me to, to understand. What am I doing, and why am I doing this? But distinctly, as I got older, I can remember one thought that I had was this feeling of distance, as I, as I served people. I am never, I thought to myself, going to put myself in the circumstances of those people. I would think to myself, mm, and whether, whether or not I was willing to admit it, I, I was putting myself up here and the other people down here. It's similar for the disciples and these children. But Jesus ignores that. He beckons the children to come to them. He embraces them. He gets on their level. I can imagine him bending down, squatting down to to be eye to eye with them. 
But more than that, he confers on them the status as inheritors of the kingdom of God. And this is where we get to the heart of this passage. You see, Jesus' goal in ministry, and Mark has been unpacking this all along in his gospel, has been to proclaim the kingdom of God. He he has described what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. He's invited people to join him in the kingdom. And now he declares that children... These children that were going to be dismissed by the disciples are the rightful heirs of the kingdom of God. And in what way does that kingdom belong to children? Because the disciples and the crowds expected the kingdom of God to come with power and to challenge the worldly rulers and authorities. Rome was this occupying force in Israel. Surely a new kingdom would come in and would displace the unwelcome invaders. But Jesus' idea is different. Look at verse 15. He explains, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What ability, what virtue does a child have that enables them to receive God's kingdom? Isn't that too complicated for a child? If you were to go to my office, you would see that I have bookcases full of books that explain the dense and complicated nature of theology. Scholars have given their lives to unpack the mystery of God. We sit here week by week and we sit under the preaching of the word, trying to understand God's character and his calling in our lives. And I'm not suggesting that we abandon those things, that careful study. But what what is Jesus getting at? Some might say that Jesus makes this proclamation about children because they are innocent. They don't have as much baggage uh, as maybe other people as they approach God. It's certainly true that children possess naivete, but are they innocent? Parents, do you want to answer that question for me this morning? David, David, the psalmist, doesn't th- seem to think so. He says in the 51st song, he says, In sin, my mother conceived me, conceived me. Jesus is not talking about a child's innocence, but their ability. Yeah, that's exactly right. See, children understand the things that they cannot do on their own. They understand their need. They understand their helplessness. So if you look around and you look at the parents of young children in the sanctuary this morning, here's what you're going to find. It looks like they could use a nap. (laughs) They've already been asked to tie shoes, wipe bottoms, make breakfast, uh, buckle car seats, comb hair, everything already this morning. Kiss a boo-boo. And when they go home this afternoon, they're going to be asked to do all the same things all over again. And tomorrow morning... Again, and the morning after that. And, G- and Jesus is saying to his disciples, in a spiritual sense, just like children are helpless, so are you. Understand that. Embrace that. It's the only way that we can come to God. Darren, you expressed that so beautifully this morning. Thank you. We come to God with absolute dependence on him. So the question this morning is this. Are we going to be like the disciples who have it all figured out or like the children who come to Jesus knowing their need and completely depending on him for their fulfillment? See, part of the problem is that you and I don't like to, we don't like to be in need. Our culture has trained us to strive for self-sufficiency. If I were to ask you this morning, do you believe, do you really believe that you need help? Do you believe that you are desperate for help? Many of us would chafe at that question. You might think to yourself, I'm doing pretty good on my own. I, um, I'm not saying I'm perfect. There are a few things that I can learn from Jesus. He can, you know, he can buff off the rough edges, but mostly I'm good. Desperate? I don't think so. Helpless? Certainly not. That is an attitude of self-sufficiency. 
If that is our attitude, then we come to church, we come to Scripture, and we look at it as a a kind of a spiritual top-off. We look at it just as a pick-me-up. I I need a little bump this morning, this week. And if I don't need a bump, then maybe I don't go, because I'm doing pretty good. Maybe I don't read about, about God and His Word, because I'm doing pretty good. We think of it that way instead of what it actually is, food for starving people, medicine for dying people, new life for dead people. Darren, again, I I said you looked at my notes because here I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter Uh, 2. You you already mentioned it. Paul makes our helplessness clear. I'm going to read the whole passage, but some of the key passages pieces are going to be up on the screen. Listen to what Paul says, starting in chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind And you and I were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul's outline is pretty clear. You were dead. And if you're not in Christ, you are dead. God made you alive. Or if you're not in Christ, God is willing to make you alive. And he did so so that you could live with him on mission for him, evidencing your new life in Christ. You, you have good works prepared for you beforehand. What are they? Well, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's not too much to say that <laughs> the job of a believer in this world is to be on mission in telling others how they can receive the same life-giving salvation offered by God in the death and resurrection of Jesus. One evangelist said it this way. Uh, He said, we are simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And if you and I live our lives like that, that is going to be so compelling that we're not going to have to go out and look for opportunities for the gospel. They're going to find us. There's something so appealing, and this is what Jesus is talking about, about never having to grow up. But we used to have a toy store, that that was their whole marketing campaign, right? Didn't we? I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. And then there's a whole rest of that song. But from the earliest ages, we have been told Act your age. Well, well, that wasn't very mature. Why don't, you, why, don't you, uh, why don't you be more mature? And maturity is certainly a good goal for parents to teach their children. We want to train them to be responsible adults. We want to raise them so that they will not have to depend on us for longer than is reasonable. But too often, maturity becomes the idol of self-sufficiency, especially for us, especially in this country. Uh, Our society and our wealth, the wealth of our nation has been built on what has been termed the Protestant work ethic. Work hard, be responsible, and good things will come to you. Haven't you heard that message? Isn't that ingrained in what we are as a nation? 
And then we take those same principles and we transfer them to our Christianity and they do not apply. Because the gospel is offered freely. The gospel is received in recognition that you and I bring nothing to the transaction. There was a man who was born in England in 1740, many, many years ago, many, many centuries ago. And he had an interest in religion. In fact, it reminds me a little bit of Darian's testimony this morning. During his younger years, he had an interest in religion. He kept spiritual journals. He endeavored to evidence moralistic behavior. And then he was saved at the age of 14 while he was attending a revival. And at first, he went to a church in which he was converted. And that church placed an emphasis on the ability and the necessity of human beings to seek for God. But as he grew in his faith and as he studied the scripture, he came to a different understanding that people are naturally sinful and cannot seek God on their own accord or through their own endeavors. And so in view of that church, he wrote one of the most famous hymns in all of the Christian faith. It's an old one, but we're going to recognize it and then we're going to close with it this morning. The man's name was Augustus Toplady and the hymn was Rock of ages. And some of the lyrics go like this. Not, listen, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, look to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. He says, foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. It sounds almost childlike in its desperation, doesn't it? And instead of that being a bad thing, that is exactly what Jesus is teaching in this passage. That the helplessness of children is for us the perfect analogy to our helplessness as we come to Christ for salvation. Let's pray this morning and then we'll close with Worship, Father, we come to you and we ask. <laughs> no, God, we come to you and we recognize that we are without you, dead, lost, helpless, and hopeless. There's no way around that. Yes, God, you value us like those little children. But God, unless we recognize our standing before you, we cannot hope to, 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 to recognize and receive the grace that you want to give us because we'll be too busy trying to do it our own way. Father, I pray that this morning you would refashion and reform our minds, give us your thoughts. God, so that we can appreciate your salvation. Father, there are certainly those here this morning who are trying to do it on their own. They think they're Christians, but they're not. They just are trying to live a good life. Father, there are, there are those here this morning who are so lost because of the weight of the sin, they don't even know where to turn. Father, I pray that they would, that they would turn to you this morning and recognize that they don't have to clean up before they come to you. Father, save them to the glory of your son this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.